I will not describe the book here because the book is a novel. I will, I want to talk about the concepts of the book. The book is called Necessary but Not Sufficient, and in my eyes, what I've tried to uh, portray in that book is technology. How should we use technology? Now, this is totally banal, yet I'm afraid that regarding almost any technology that we use, it takes a long time until we get the benefits, and not because of the technology, but because of the way that we implement it. And I'm talking about any technology whatsoever. And the motto of how to do it right is a recognition that technology by itself is necessary, but not sufficient. Now let me explain what I mean. For technology to bring benefit, it must be that the technology is diminishing an existing limitation. Let me say it again. Technology will bring benefit if and only if this technology diminishes an existing limitation. Why do I claim it? If the technology does not diminish any limitation whatsoever, how can it possibly bring any benefit? It's obvious that it cannot. At the same time, if the technology does diminish a limitation, then it must bring benefit. Otherwise, why do we call the thing that it diminished a limitation to start with? And this is the base for my claim that technology will bring benefit if and only if it diminishes limitation. But now, let's take it a step further. The limitation by definition, had to exist before the technology is brought into the game. What do we do when we have limitation? What we do is we live with it until we solve it. We learn to live with our limitation. Which means, due to the fact that we have a limitation, we have developed some habits of behavior, and if the limitation is big, some rules of behavior, and if the limitation is very big, way of life, so that we do not constantly crash into the limitation. We learn to live with it. For example, before we had trains and cars, we had a limitation, and the limitation was that it was, for all practical purposes, uh, not really feasible to do more than 40 kilometers, sorry, I'm in the States, more than 25 miles a day. And because of it, our way of life was that our living distance from the place that we worked was usually no more than one hour walk. That was a way of life, and that's how the whole world has been done. By the way, how many of you today leaves more than one hour work from your working place? A lot. For, my, for example, in my case, I live about uh, two years walking distance from my working place. <laughs> Not to mention swimming distance. <laughs> now, Look what's happening. Suppose that we implemented the new technology. And we implemented it very nicely, what we call very nicely. We implemented it so that the limitation was diminished. But we did not address at all the rules that we have, the rules that acknowledge the existence of the limitation the rules that enable us to live together with the limitation. And we don't touch them at all. Will we get the full benefits that we should have get from the technology? And the answer is definitely not. These rules are bringing back the limitation for all practical purposes. Let me give you an example to see to what extent 
it, it, this phenomena exist. And all my examples I will take today from computer systems. Here, in, in some way, I'm closing a circle. The work of TOC have started with scheduling software. Yes, that was 20 years ago. Then, in 86, it was kiss goodbye software, let's do the real things. Now, I'm saying, no, 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 it's about time to bring it back, so I'm closing a circle. I'm now going to talk again about computer software or computer systems and how to really get the benefits from them. So I will go back now, in order to demonstrate these concepts that I've just told you, let's take the field and the era of MRP. I know this era very well because that was a time that I went out of the university into the real life, and I'm talking about the early 80s, the MRP crusade. How many of you know or heard about MRP? Please raise your hand. Beautiful, all of you. What was the limitation that the MRP was really trying to address? As you're going to see, my question today, whenever I see technology, the first question is, what limitation does it try to diminish? So, when we are talking about the MRP, what was the limitation that the MRP have tried to diminish. And in my opinion, the limitation was the speed to do net requirement. Now let me explain, even though you know about MRP, it doesn't mean that all of you are experts in it. Let me explain this concept of net requirement. Suppose that we get an order from a client. And our question is, what should we produce? What should ma material should we order in order to be able to supply the order? So the first thing is, when we get the order, is to look whether or not we have already the finished product in our warehouse. And because if we have, we don't have to produce anything and we don't have to order any material. We just have to take what we have and to ship it. So, the first thing is to take the order and to net from it the amount that we have in finished goods. Hopefully, if we have all the amount, then we finished. If we don't have all the amount, we have to take the residual. For example, if the order was for 100 units and we had 20 on stock available, so 20 we have, we have to deal with the rest, with the net, which is 80. Now, what do we do here? We have to produce it, so we look in the bill of material. This product is composed out of these three major sub-assemblies, and each one of these major sub-assemblies is made out of two more sub-assemblies, with here material, and here is a material, and here are parts that we have to process through this routing, and here are the materials for the parts. What do we do now? We take then the order, we net the, the finished goods, then we start to break it down in the bill of material and we say, okay, how many finished sub-assemblies we have, we net them, do we have anything still? In other words, do we have to produce more? If so, let's go to the next level, how much of this do we have? We net it as well, okay, we still have something that we produce, fine, we go down. Now we have to net what is on the floor as work in process. We reached here with some number yet. That's the number that we have to release to the floor. Now we'll net from it how much do we have material on hand, and if we still have something, a number is still remaining, that's the number that I have to order from my vendors. Is it understood? Hello? It's called net requirement. Now, if you have some non-trivial product, to do such a calculation is not exactly five seconds. By the way, look on how many possible places I have here for mistakes. Quite a lot. If I'm getting a flood of orders, and for each order I have to do all this work, and I have a product of, let's say, even three levels in the bill of material, this is a lot of manual work. 
At the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, a plant of this nature of 500 people had about 20 people that almost all their work was to do net requirement. Do you understand why? This is mammoth work. Now, of course, this was too much. So what have we done? The limitation here was the time and the efforts to do the net requirement. We have developed some rules of how to manage and how to live with this mammoth amount of tedious work. And the rules were, for example, we invented something called master scheduler, master schedule. In other words, we don't deal anymore with individual order, we batch them. We batch them together. So not, we'll have, not have to do this work with every single order. We are taking all the orders for the same product at this level and we batch it together. And everywhere in the world almost, without even talking to each other, the most practical batching was once a month. We batch it on a monthly bucket. Also, when we do this tedious work, and remember, a plant may have easily 500 different products, not to mention the variations and so on, the rules almost everywhere was you do net requirement once a month. Yes, we knew very well that due to that the inventories are much higher, and we knew very well that due to this mechanism we are jeopardizing our ability to react fast to an order. Because we are not dealing anymore with an individual orders here. So wait for next month's minimum. Is it understood all of that? Eh? No wonder because the amount of work was enormous. Can you imagine 20 people doing all this work almost all the time? Now came the MRP. With a beautiful computer and surprise, surprise, all this work was done Overnight! I remember still the enthusiasm. Overnight! By the way, today on the PC it takes about five minutes. Overnight! And of course, this is a huge thing, and the MRP crusade started to move, and almost every company cracked and bought the MRP and implemented it. And then you started to hear some murmur coming out. And the murmur was, where are the benefits? Where are the benefits? And more and more people says, wait a minute, I've done all this work, where are the benefits? And then, as a reaction to all these huge complaints, we went and invented a new concept, a phrase. It was more than a phrase, it was a the whole movement. And this was called Class A Users. How many of you have heard about Class A Users of MRP? Raise your hand. Not so many, but about half. Those that have been really involved. Class A User meant what? What do you have to do in order really to do it right? How much education have you given to all the people involved? Education about dependent and independent demands, education about batch, uh, to, uh, optimized batch uh, quantity, all of that. And how much did you invest in cleaning the data? Because the computer is dumb. And the data have to be accurate. And we started to talk about 99% accuracy of data required. And then, of course, people came and said, wait a minute, I'm not saving even one person. Before that, I had 20 people doing the net requirement. Now I have 20 people cleaning and checking the data. Which was not a joke. There was very few companies that talked about startling bottom line's benefits. Huge reduction in inventory, huge reduction in response time. There were maybe something like 3% of the MLP users. By the way, in the big debate that APICs have held in 86, if I'm not mistaken, and I was one of the uh, debaters, and the question came, what do you think about class A users, and the whole concept, and I said, I think that this is baloney. Because of one reason. 
in all the criteria of becoming class A user, there, was, there is, for me, one measurement missing. How much bottom line have you done from it? There was no mention on bottom line benefits. I said, you're missing the boat here. Because in order to be class A user, what I see is how much money have I paid to the software, how much money have I paid to the implementers, what about what I'm getting? My question is, here is a technology that diminished the limitation without a doubt, rather than almost a whole month to do the net requirement, it takes overnight. And this limitation is severe because the, Due to that limitation, the way that we have lived have caused us to more than double the inventory and to who knows by how much we are increasing our ability, the delay in our ability to, uh, to react to the market. Remember, with this mechanism, I cannot react immediately. It's minimum one month. How come that only 3% or 4% of the companies have got benefits and all the rest did not. Can anybody guess what happened? By the way, I must admit that at that time, I myself didn't pay attention to it. Well, it turned out that the vast majority of the companies that implemented MRP continued to run the computer to do that requirement once a month. Hello. Now, of course, you don't get the benefits. This is not a joke. This is reality. Look what am I talking about here. We took the technology, the technology of diminished the limitation, the rule, the rule that was instituted before the technology, the rule that was instituted in order to enable us to live with the limitation, stayed behind. What do we get as a benefit? Almost nothing. Is it understood? Yes or no? I can't hear you. Yeah. Which means? Whenever you take a new technology, the first question that you have to ask yourself is what limitation or limitations this technology diminishes? Once you get this answer, now comes the real question that almost nobody asks, which is what rules are we employing today? What rules are we employing today that acknowledge the limitation. What rules are we employing today that all their purpose is to enable us to live with the limitation? Because if we don't identify these rules, the chance that we will touch them and change them is minimal. Once we identify these rules, now we have to ask another question. What should be now the rules? Now that we are going to eliminate, to diminish this limitation, what should be now the rules? Because there is more than one possibility, and some of them are not exactly nice. Only then are we going to get the full benefit from the technology. If we don't do that, sometimes we'll get a fraction of the benefits, sometimes will get even negative. The more powerful the technology, and powerful the technology means the more huge limitation it diminishes, the bigger is the problem if we don't address the rules that were instituted much before the technology, the rules that enable us to live with the limitation. I would like now to address not the MRP, but the ERP. In my eyes, ERP is vastly different than MRP. The minutes that you are looking on what limitation ERP addresses, you see that the net, requ net requirement, all of that, is a chupchik for ERP. ERP addresses a much, much bigger limitation. What is the limitation that ERP addresses? I believe that ERP addresses extremely well the limitation of availability of data. If you have a full-blown ERP system, what you get is what? 
the ability to collect relatively easily and without much efforts huge amount of data from the organization, the ability to store it and to transfer it from one place in the organization to another without much hassle, and not less important, the ability to retrieve the data, whatever you want, by whoever you want, whenever you want. ERP for organizations is a phenomenal answer to the question of availability of data. Whatever data is needed and in almost real time. What a limitation, what an answer. Phenomenal. Now let me ask you something. You are in the market. You are hearing things. You are living in organizations. How many organizations are extremely happy with their ERP system? How many are dancing all over the place and said, ERP has saved our company, we are making a fortune now? How many? Did you ever hear about one? What do we hear instead? We hear bitching and moaning that goes on and on. How much time to install it, what the hell do we get from it, and so on and so forth. And fellas, just look on it. The price to install an ERP is not exactly some peanuts. The price of the software is high, the price of the implementation is much higher, and the price of the disturbance to the organization until the bloody system starts to work is much, much higher. And if it diminishes such a huge limitation, how come that we don't see huge benefits? Hello. What do you think is happening here? Why is nobody standing up and saying, wait a minute, something is absurd. If we have such a phenomenal technology, and the technology does diminish a huge limitation. Because let's face it, how many times the managers, or not even managers, people in organizations were complaining about, why didn't you tell me? In other words, where is the data available on time? All of a sudden, all the data is available, almost in real time. It should have, since it reduces such a huge limitation, it should have brought huge benefits. Where are the benefits? Where are the benefits? What we are hearing, rather than beautiful stories, we are hearing about threats of litigations. Listen, I'm not blaming the software companies. I'm definitely not talking down about ERP. If there is something that ERP have proven, is that it does diminish this limitation. For sure, without a doubt. But so, where are the limitations? Where is the benefits? And the benefits probably are not there because of what? We are not touching the rules that we, as organizations, have invented and employed the rules that consider what? The rules that consider that vast amount of the data will not be available, and when it will be available, it will be much too late. Am I right, yes or no? What are these rules? Since the limitation is so huge, we are talking about more than rules. We are talking about way of life. And what is the way of life in an organization when you take for granted that the majority of the data that happens in some distance from you will not be available to you, and when it will be available to you, it will be not available immediately. It will be within some long time until you see it. How can we operate under such a limitation? Think about it. Don't you realize then under such a limitation, it looks like the only way to operate is what? Do whatever you can within the sphere that you do see. Shall I repeat? Everyone, do whatever you can within the sphere that you do see. And that's what is happening. That's what happened. We call it silos. 
And within the silos, we are calling it local optima measurements, uh, local optima management. Do you understand where it's coming from? It didn't came from the fact that people were stupid. It came from the fact that people acknowledge, I don't know what cells have done today, and I will not know it today, and probably I will not know it for a few weeks sometimes, if you're talking about large organization. But I have to decide what I'm producing today. So let's build the silos. Let's do whatever I can within my frame. And the silos are, by now, with thick walls. I know organizations that production talks to distribution and they both talk to marketing only at the CEO office. You think that I'm joking? Those of you who work in that companies know that I'm not. We are talking about a culture of local optima. Not because people were stupid, but because that was the obvious way when you cannot have enough data on what is happening in the whole system. So if you cannot know what's going in the system, do what you can within the scope that you do see. Local Optima started to take over. As a matter of fact, it wasn't so hard for the local Optima to take over because let's look on how industry have developed. Industry did not come full-fledged in existence in the world. Not like armies that already from prehistorical days we were talking about hundreds and thousands of people that have to operate as one in the industry it didn't start it like that. Where did the industry start it? It started from the Meister, from the individual with some helpers and it grew from there. It started with the person who knew everything but with the person who was trying to optimize his area. As it, as it was, his area was a total thing. But this culture of optimize what you can do have been brought from the beginning. The question starts to be, how many rules an organization today employ? Rules which are based on local optima. Because as long as we are using these rules. The fact that the data is available, that we can see the whole thing, doesn't help anymore. Is it understood? Yes or no? And the amount of rules of local optima is are huge. How many companies, when they implement ERP, are changing rules? Almost all of them. But what rules do they change? Do they change the rules which are based on local optima? And the answer is no. They are changing rather than this process of data flow. We will use that process of data flow. Why? Because SAP tell us to do it. Fine. Nobody is really touching the rules that we had due to the fact that the limitation was there. This rule stays in place. No wonder that when we put this technology, phenomenal technology, that diminish the limitation, it doesn't help much because the rules that we operate still acknowledge that the limitation is there. So it's there. In this field, it's not easy at all to change the rules due to the fact that in this particular case the rules are the rules of local optima and there is something else that supports local optima to the sky and I'm talking about a different culture a culture that exists three, since probably people were born a culture that exists that dominates how people should behave but do not dominate technology. There are two different cultures here. One culture is a culture that says 
a cent plus 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 a cent accumulate to a nice fortune. I don't know about you, I was raised to believe in that culture. My parents raised me to believe in it. My teachers raised me to believe in it. What about you? Have you been raised in the same way? Yes or no? Yes. Sometimes to the extent that I was told, you must finish this piece of bread. And the reason was because people are starving in India. <laughs> Until today, I couldn't figure out how. By the fact that I will finish it, people will not starve in India. <laughs> save, save, save everywhere. Don't you realize that this is a culture of everything counts? of save every cent of local optima. There is another culture, also very ancient. And this is a culture that governs technology. In technology, we are not talking about a cent plus a cent plus a cent plus a cent plus a cent accumulate to a fortune. We are not talking about that at all. I believe that the first one that probably verbalized it, who knows what he really said, but the legend is that this person said, Give me, give me, or he said, if I can find a leverage point, I can move the earth. This guy was Archimedes. He is not talking about a cent plus a cent until we reach the result. He is talking about reaching huge result within one shot. The opposite of the other culture. By the way, when you come into a person like Bill Gates and ask him, do you believe in a cent plus a cent, that's how you, you build 50 billion dollars? He says, probably will answer you, I'm too young for that. Technology and all our way to get technology, we are not looking of 0.1% improvement. We are looking on a jump, on something like, let's get 30% better performance from our new uh, design from our new technology and there are today industries these crazy industries where the standard is double the performance of all products within one year every year do you know about such companies of course you do by the way these same companies are not saying let's double the performance of our net profit every year as a standard they're talking about doubling the performance of the product but why don't they say the others? Why don't they say, let's double the performance of our net profit every year? For year and year and year and a year after year, ten, 10 years as a standard. Because probably when we are coming to the organization, even in technology driven companies, we are still thinking in terms of a cent plus a cent plus a cent plus a cent. I came to realize how deep is this conviction just three months ago. I was asked to participate in a conference organized by Industry Week. And this conference was in order to announce the 10 best plants in America. And they insisted that I will come and be the keynote speaker. And I've done my spiel for one and a half hour. Everybody read the goal, of course. Everybody loved it. Everybody loves me. He beautiful. <laughs> and then I was sitting there listening to the 10 presentations. Because except for this presentation, the 10 presentations that went for two days was the presentations from the plants that have won the award. No one have used to see one iota. They love it. So what? We can do, we have to do something else. And you know what they were doing? By the way, these people are wonderful. Unbelievable. It's list and list and endless list of actions that they're taking for minimum five years in order to reach the level that they are now. Endless lists. And one of the items of the list is, for example, how many improvement projects do they start and finish every year? And I still remember the number that was said by the first plant. And the number was 1,847 improvement projects. Do you, can you imagine how it sounds in my ears? For heaven's sake, these people are in chupchicks up to here. And yes, 
even got results after five years of mammoth work. And you know what was so discouraging? These results are no better, and in one aspect even worse, than the results that we expect from a TOC company to reach after six months. And by the way, almost no one is reporting how much the throughput went up. And those that the reports are talking about 20% up of throughput. What's happening here? And then I've noticed that there was one sentence that every one of them was saying in more than once. Every one of them. And they were talking about companies that comes to visit them in order to see how they're doing, and they are looking for a silver bullet. And what does these companies are telling them? There is no silver bullet. You have to work hard to do all of that, and that, and that, and that, and that, for a long time, and then you get the results. Only then I start to realize, do you know what they call there is no silver bullet? They are talking about the fact that you cannot get significant results within a short time if you hit on the right place. They are talking about the culture of a cent plus a cent plus a cent. What we in TOC are talking is a culture of where is the leverage point? Where is the erroneous assumption? Once we identify that, Okay, now how do we build the solution? How do we build the lever? And vroom, let's move everything. Total different culture. But then something else comes to my mind. Wait a minute. These people do know what I'm talking about. These people have read the goal. These people not just read the goal. They love the goal. They call it common sense. So if they, they know what is common sense, why do they continue to, go, to do the common nonsense? And then I've got my answer. Let me ask you something. TQM, is it the Archimedes way, the leverage point, or is it a cent plus a cent plus a cent? Where are you supposed to do the quality improvements? everywhere, continuously, by everybody. What about just in time, the way that is taught here and in Japan? Same thing. What about lean? Same thing. I don't have any problem with their techniques. They are beautiful. I have the problem with the philosophy. I have the problem with the philosophy of cent plus cent. But now look what is happening. A person looks on something, think, comes to the conclusion that's the answer. Then he looks around and he finds out everybody is, is telling him that the answer is wrong. The answer is something else. Quite different, almost opposite. How many people do you know that have enough self-confidence to say, forget it. I came to this conclusion, it makes sense to me, I'm going and doing it. How, what percentage of people do you think exist with such high self-confidence? Hello? Two percent? One percent? This is about the percent of the companies that read the goal and implement it. One, two percent. The rest read the goal, say it's beautiful, and do nothing. You know, for a long time I'm saying already that I have the impression that the goal is a Bible of industry, of production. It is a Bible of production. Everybody believes in it, almost nobody is doing it. Now take what we said here and combine it with what we said about ERP. Again, since we didn't have the information coming from all sides, since we didn't have the availability of it, one of the, if not the most obvious solution was, fine, do whatever you can within the spheres that you do see. In other words, immediately it means do local optima. If you combine it with the notion of cent plus, plus cent plus cent, it means that where do we look for improvements? We don't look for improvements on something that will change in one shot, a major rule that is basing all our actions, but we are looking for the tiny things 
We are even afraid to think on the big changes. In, big changes in terms of getting the results, in terms of rules, not in terms of efforts. Lately, since the only place that we are free of the cent by cent mentality is technology, over there we don't have any problem to look for leverage point. That's what we are doing in technology. This is a standard in technology. We tried to find a solution to how to get results, not by trying to address the rules, but by trying to apply even more technology. And this is what we see in the last two years, some of it much before that, but it is a wave for the last two years, and it has even a name today, and it's called APS, Advanced Planning Scheduling. Do you know what they are? These are the systems that take all the variables, optimize all of it, and tell you now to each work center and each material, what do you do now? And if there is a problem, no problem. Rerun the software, it's so powerful, you get the new schedules, which have taken already the disruption into account, optimized everything again, do it. And this is now spreading everywhere. What do you think my opinion about it? <laughs> and in this case, I know what is it. You see, one of the first, if not the first, APS, and in my opinion, something which is on a level that was not yet reached again, was the software that I've started my journey into this field. It was called OPT. I don't know how many of you remember it. OPT was an APS, phenomenal APS. By the way, the mathematics inside is amazing. It's a way to achieve a practical optimum, which is a, a notion that I had to explain to mathematicians, a practical optimum by doing optimization in 11, and 11 dimension space. Okay? It's really sophisticated. And it worked quite nicely, and I dumped it like I don't know what. And not because of that. You see, first of all, my co the concept is bothering me. If we did reduce the limitation, if we eliminated it, how comes that we don't get the benefits? Let's think about it rather than throw even more technology into the game. And we know now that by simple logic, it happened because we don't address the rules. So why don't we address the rules? And what brings us to believe that if we don't address the rules, then more technology will compensate for it to the extent that it will behoove us. Now, this APS thing is even worse than most people think simply because most people don't know even how to check their claims. What they say is, I've took everything into account, and this I can show you. We have took 300 work centers into account, four plants together even, all the routing, all the bill of material, all the existing inventory, whoosh, we have done a phenomenal optimization. Here is the best schedule. They can prove almost every word except for one word in what I've said. They can prove that they took all the resources into account. They can prove that they have considered all the inventory in all the places. They can prove that they did look at all the plants together. And they can prove it easily, just by showing you that if you change any data, the schedule will be affected in accordance. They cannot prove one point. They claim that the schedule is the best. As a matter of fact, they cannot prove that the schedule is not lousy. They can prove that the schedule fits the data. But is it good or bad schedule? They cannot, and they don't try even. They just tell you. But how can you check whether or not the schedule is good or not? Because what they tell you is, you don't believe me? Fine, here is all the data. Do it by hand. 
I know, I've done the same. <coughs> Twenty years ago. Well, if you really look into it, you find out there is an easy way to check and to show to what extent all this notion of this huge optimizations is wrong and does not lead to good benefit. It leads to even worse results. Unless, of course, it's done properly. Because they have clients that will tell you we've got huge results. About 5% of their clients. Go and check what the clients have done. These clients that got results are using the APS not according to how they were told to use it, but they're using the APS to implement a version of drum buffer rope. Each one of them. Because if you are looking around, MRP to force it to do drum buffer rope is much more difficult than to force an APS to do a drum buffer rope. And that's where the results are coming. But if you look on it conceptually, look what is a mistake and how to go and expose it and do it. Take any example. Run it on APS. One of the things that APS is trying to do is to minimize the number of orders that are not going to be delivered on time. So in order to check the APS, take an example that has at least one bottleneck. And if it has a bottleneck, a real bottleneck, then of course at least one of the orders will not be able to finish on time. Is it understood? Yes or no? Okay. Take such an example. And they will show you, okay, this and this, let's say two orders cannot finish on time, and this is a bottleneck, and here is the amount of time that you have to add in order to bring the orders on time. And that's very nice. But now, do the following. Schedule one day maintenance on the bottleneck. The software, every APS software, is, is capable and strong enough to take such input. One of the, the bottleneck is out for one day. Maintenance. Now you tell me, what do you expect that will happen? If we took a situation where two orders did not finish on time, every other order finished on time, and we have killed the bottleneck for one day, what must be and should be the impact on the schedule? Come on. The two orders that were late will be late by additional day. And the other orders that finished earlier will not finish as early. And maybe one order will cross the, the line by what, from the day before to day after. And this is if all the orders have, are moving through the bottleneck that you've killed one day on it. This is what you expect, and this is what you should expect. And this is the logical answer. And then run it on the APS. And then you will get the shock of your life. Because the result will not be what we said. The result will be that the orders which are late, at least one of them, is not late anymore. And instead, two others are late. Shuffle. Hello. And then you ask them, and they will tell you, you see, we have acknowledged the problem and we've created a new action schedule. What's excellent about it? Just yesterday, I told the client, I will ship it to you on time, no problem. And today, I have to come to him and to say, sorry, you'll be late. And another client that already told that he'll be late, all of a sudden, it will be early. Boom. And by the way, what am I afraid? Tomorrow, another disturbance will happen. And once again, everything is shuffled. Where is it coming from, this crazy answer, this crazy situation? It's coming from inherent in the logic of how the APS is built. See, what is the logic of APS? We want results, which is beautiful logic. What is the result that we want? We want more throughput with less lead time and inventory. In this sense, the APS is already much more in line with TUC than anything else. We want more throughput. We want 
less lead time in inventory. How are we going to do it? And the answer is, let's optimize much better. Let me show you what I mean. Look on the conflict that we see. Let's optimize much better. Let me show you what I mean. Look on the conflict that we see. What we want is to manage well. In order to manage well, I need to not waste, and from the other side is react quickly. The clients want what I wanted yesterday. The faster I will give everybody whatever they want, the better I will be considered as a manager. It's the same thing, don't waste, because if you waste and don't pay attention to what you have, the expenses will go through the roof. This, in order to, to react quickly, means have a lot of spares, correct? Of everything, of material, of people, of, what, of machines. Then you can react on the spot. But not waste means don't have, don't have spares, but let's say a lot. There is this conflict. And we are playing on this conflict. What do we say? We say let's have this computer, this super brain, mathematical brain, and it will optimize, it will optimize so that it will minimize the amount of spares that I have to do here, and by that, it will minimize the conflict. Is it understood, yes or no? Hello? Have I lost you? Not yet? Good. In order to do that, what do they do now? We have to make sure that whenever we see, inside when we build the schedule, whenever we see a resource available immediately let's find him what to do let's find him work if there is work whenever we see a work order that is not dealt let's find the resource to work on it in this way i can minimize the amount of spare capacity that i need and at the same time to minimize lead time is it understood yes or no this is the way it's of working now look what is happening due to that Due to this concept, suppose that I am starting the schedule with one small change, and the change is one stage on one work order is not finished, relative to it is finished. What is this small change causing? And by the way, this is something that happens all the time, it's not even Murphy. If it is finished, then a resource will be assigned immediately to the next operation. And due to that, whenever it's finished, another resource will be assigned to the next operation after that. But if it's not finished, this resource is not going to be assigned to the next operation. It will be assigned to another work order. And due to that, the next resource will be assigned also to another work order. Look what is happening. Due to this mentality of let's assign everything immediately, what you are getting is that a small disruption is now spreading through two mechanisms. It's spreading through the resources. This resource will not do that, and because of it will not do that, and because of it will not do that. This is one mechanism where the change is spreading. The other mechanism is the mechanism of the product itself. This work order will not be finished because of it. The next stage will disrupt, will change what the resource is doing and so on. So what you get is that the change that happens here, for example, is spreading through the resources to the other places and through the, the product itself to here and then to here. You see what is happening in each one place like that? It's continued to spread into all directions. This is a very, very effective mechanism 
to spread the disruption everywhere. Where do you have more disrupt more effect? The less excess capacity you have in the plant, the more it spreads everywhere. If you are talking, here I am talking about from a lot of experience, because this thing killed me in 81, 82. If you are talking about a plant that have only 50% excess capacity, whenever you try to rerun a schedule, even if you done perfectly everything according to the schedule, simply small lack of reporting in terms of I haven't finished the batch or I have finished the batch, even if everything was perfect, that never happens, the schedule that is coming out is not tied up to the schedule that you have released before. Everything is changing. And due to that, the orders are changing, and all the work instructions are changing, and people are telling you it's craziness. Due to that, they do not rerun it every time, but they rerun it once a week, and even then they know everything will start to change. Which is total craziness. And actually, this is not craziness only from the practical point of view, it is craziness for something much, much worse. This means that we have instituted a mechanism in which a small local disturbance is now spreading everywhere. Do you know what we've done? We have violated the most important principle that Deming is trying to teach, was trying to teach the world, which is there are small disruptions, don't touch them. If you will try to realign a machine, wherever there is a small deviation, you with your own hands are turning random noise into systematic, much larger noise. And he was talking about one machine. Here is a phenomenal mechanism to do it on the whole planet to kill ourselves. The severity of, of that so much that in 82, I've swallowed my pride and I've dumped this phenomenal algorithm and I came out with a version called Observe saying we'll optimize only the bottleneck everything else must be subordinated to it and that's what dumps all this all these uh, dis disturbances and that's what in our continuity because you see there is something that we don't pay attention to which is the ABC in, in, in uh, in uh, TOC. As long as Murphy exists, there we must have spare capacity. If we have spare capacity, don't even dream to use the spare capacity just because it's there. Because if you use the spare capacity as if you must use it, you will create havoc and increase the inventories and so on. So the trick becomes when to use the spare capacity and when not to use it. And that's the change in the rules that we have to put. Thank God that, by the way, just in time we've done just that. When not to use the spare capacity. When you don't have a Kenbin card, don't work. Now, look on what is happening. We have the ERP. The ERP is enterprise-wide. If we really want the benefits, we have to find out what are the rules of the local optima and what do we have to do in order to change them then we'll get phenomenal benefits if we don't do that we are easy prey for mathematical algorithms which are totally crazy not only that we will not get the results or we'll get just a fraction of the results in my book, what I've tried to do is, first of all, to show you to what extent we are going here astray. To what extent even what we call today the justification of ERP is something that we would not have accepted as justification in any other case. When you are coming to justify an investment, you have to justify it by bottom line. Am I right? When you come to just to, to justify an ERP system, all of a sudden justification like better visibility into operation is good enough. And when you really take all the items, and by the way, I took the items of the most respectable companies, 
the items of how do you justify ERP. And you take them and you try to transform them to bottom line, you find out many are not translatable, some are, but then the proof is in the book, something which is dreadful. It shows that if you are a company above a billion dollars, in about, above a billion dollars, then the ERP will give at the current stage, with your wrong rules, it will give benefits to cover the entire cost of implementation. It will cover itself around three years' time. But as you go below the $1 billion, the justification is reduced so quickly that it's unbelievable. I don't believe that when you reach the $500 million, that the ERP justifies itself anymore. Remember, I don't say that we shouldn't have ERP. I'm saying that as long as we are so dumb as not to take the benefits from reduced limitation by changing the rules, the anachronistic rules that we still have, under that situation, ERP does not justify itself in a company of less than $500 million a year. Not at all. Then come the point of fine. If we are willing to change the rules, comes the second question. Is the ERP, as it stands now, suitable to support an organization with the new rules? For example, ask yourself what ERP will support a just-in-time production environment? And you'll find out most ERPs will have, will have to go through major hiccups and they will not really support it, not fully. And if we are talking about which ERP system, full ERP system, is today supporting drum buffer open buffer management, what is the answer? Zero. And because of it, what is happening? Either we say, okay, we have the ERP, and now we have a private system on the side that we do with Excel and so on. Or we buy some sophisticated APS and we torture it to, do, to become a, a drum buffer rope and we put it so that it's somewhat interfacing with the ERP. Why do we have to go like that? Especially when we know one thing. Damn it, in two years we'll get a new version. What are we going to do then? <laughs> Start again everything? So it's about time to look on what are the changes that are needed to be done inside the ERP, what is the magnitude and what will be the benefits. That's what I'm trying to do in this book. By the way, don't get the impression that it's a technical book. It is not a love story, but <laughs> what I've tried to do in order to make things witty and so on, what I've tried to do is to address two uh, issues that might be of interest to you. One is, what is a life in a Nasdaq company? We know that the Nasdaq companies are quite different than regular companies. I'm talking about the super high-tech companies. Okay? What is a the life there? Why is it so up, down, crazy, and so on? The lifetime, the, 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 the speed in which things are happening in those type of companies, I would say that what is happening there in three months is equivalent to about what happens in regular business or regular industry in three years. And to understand what is the meaning of it, what is the environment, how does it operate and so on, this is the background of all this book which compensates for things like that, okay? <laughs> of the proof of why APS will not by definition work and what to do in order to make it work. The other thing is I'm analyzing the history of the ERP company. The heroes of the book are not plant manager and his staff. It is the CEO of a software company and his staff. And I'm analyzing the period of 98-99. Uh, At the beginning of 98, ERP was the most hottest things in the investment community, more hot than the internet today. You could have raised whatever amount of money that you wanted for the ERP. In the middle of 99, you couldn't cause an investor to touch an ERP company with a 10-foot pole. What the hell have happened? Okay? Now, people say, wait, okay. So what? 
what really happened. So this is a full analysis. Okay, through the story, you see exactly what happened, why it must have happened. And the second half of the book is, of course, fiction, because the second half of the book is the solution and what the company could have done in order to make it huge success and take over everything, something that did not happen in reality because no one have implemented the solution. But the solutions that I'm talking about is what? Understanding what are the rules that has to be changed, what are the anachronistic rules that becomes anachronistic due to the fact that the ERP is diminishing the limitation, what does it mean in terms of what changes has to be done in the software? My estimation is that if you are taking a full-blown ERP, about 3% new code has to be written, and about 40% of old, old code has to be erased. That's it. And then it's working beautifully. By the way, it takes much, much less time to erase code, but it takes much, much more time to convince programmers to erase code. <laughs> so over there is a real battle, not on the writing of the 3%, which are like, for example, uh, how do you tie up correctly? How do you force the APS that is needed in so many places in order to optimize the bottleneck? And in the book, I'm showing where is it essential to optimize the bottleneck and where can you do it manually? And how do you tie it into the ERP rather than trying to schedule everything in accordance in the APS way. This combination of the APS working on the bottleneck and the ERP doing everything else is by far better than the APS alone. At the same time, we need a new piece of code like, for example, the buffer management, which does not exist at all. Okay? All of that is what is coming out to be the 3%. But then, a major part of the, part of the, of the software which is missing is the measurements. The measurements are, that the ERP are giving us, is a to the measurements that we use today, which are basically cost accounting based measurements, yuck. You all know the problem. What you don't know, and it was not enough emphasis in my previous books, even though I wrote it here and there. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are dealing with a part of a company, a link, and you have, this link has to guide what it should do. TIOE, throughput inventory operating spans, are the name of the game in terms of guiding decisions and so on. But when we are dealing with relationship between links, with the silos, or relationship between companies, in other words, the supply chain, the operational measurements, the key here is not throughput inventory and operating expense, which of course have to be the ruler from the top. The key is the throughput dollar days and the inventory dollar days. They are the key to enable a smooth functioning of a chain, either internally or externally. All the proof of it and so on is in this new book. Now how many of you know about throughput dollar days and inventory dollar days? Raise your hand. Okay. About half. I wrote about it quite extensively in the past, but I never wrote to what extent these are the key whenever you're talking about a supply chain. There is a huge problem in a supply chain. The biggest problem in a supply chain is that one link don't exactly trust and love the other. And trust is nice as long as we have excellent measurements to act as a watch guard. What are the measurements that we need to employ so each link can trust the other? And these are the throughput dollar days in the inventory dollar days, and it's about time to start to use them on a major scale. Essential. Don't hold your breath. It will take about two months or three months for my publisher to bring the book out. He does cover all of it, and then he shows the practicality of what I think, how the whole field of the software for organization should be done. There is another huge dichotomy out there. 
And I'm now talking from the point of view of the clients. I'm a company, I'm coming to, be, to buy an ERP system. If I'm a very large company, I'm talking here about easily $50 million, easily. I'm not talking about how much it will cost me really to implement it, and the damage of the disturbance in the operation, so on. At this size company, I'm doing investments of $50 million probably once a month, big deal. Nevertheless, until I'm deciding on this investment in ERP, it will take maybe eight months, many committees, and I will still, when I decide, I will do it with butterflies in my belly. And why? Because one of the aspects that most software companies and hardware companies, especially software companies, refuse to even look at is to what extent this investment in a computer system is not like almost any other investment. As a big company, I'm making investments of this order of magnitude every month, but in what? In new companies, or in buildings, or in machines. In each case of such an investment, I have an asset. An asset that I can take to the bank as a collateral, minimum. Now I invested $50 million into a computer system. Do I have a collateral in my hand? Can I take the computer system that invested 50 million to a bank and put it as a collateral? Show me such a bank. They will laugh in my face. What do I have in my hand as an investment? Nothing. So the risk here is by far bigger. More than that, I know that if I come and want to sell it to somebody else, like I bought a machine and I want to sell it, or I bought a building and I want to resell it, I bought a computer system, now I want to resell it, who will buy it? The value is zero for it. But on top of it, I have another problem. I know that even though I'm buying the state of the heart art, software and, com and hardware of today, in two years, what I have is old. Am I right, yes or no? Hello? And then I start to ask myself, I'm not buying anything anyhow. I'm not buying any asset. If that's the case, why should I buy it at all? Why won't I buy? what it really is. It's not an investment, it's a service. So why won't we call it a service and pay according to service? I will give you the data, you give me back the information. Whatever my people want, whoever wants it, whenever he wants it, in whatever format he wants. That's what I need it for. But I don't want to go through this mumbo-jumbo of I'm buying thin air. I'm buying a service paying. Give me the service. And I will pay like I'm paying for a service on an ongoing basis. Glad. Why won't we turn this field from a fiasco into something much that makes much more business sense? Is it better for the ERP companies? Oh, by far. Because one of the problems of the ERP companies is to what extent they are exhausting their markets. Because you see, you sold a company, an ERP. The chance that you can resell an ERP to that company in the next five years is not exactly high. But the real message that I wanted to do here is relating to the fact that many of you are technology-driven companies. You are implementing technology and many of you are providing technology to the market. And many of you that provide technology to the market are complaining about marketing constraint. Here is a way of how to address your marketing constraint. Again, what are the steps? You provide a technology, fine. Ask the first question. Verbalize clearly what limitation does your technology diminish for your client? Once you do that, you have to go outside your boundary. Today, you don't go into the underwears of your client. Now you have to do it. You will have to go there, and you will have to think, and you will have to do it, because they will not. Or you cannot afford the time until they will. You have to ask and find out the answer. What? rules exist today in the client 
rules that enable the client to live with the limitation that you are going to diminish. And as part of your package, you will have to show not only which rules have to be changed, but how to cause the change in your client. So it looks like a harder sale, maybe, and on the surface it is, but it's not, because then you can tie up your technology directly to real bottom lines that your clients will achieve very, very quickly. And if your horizon about your company is a little bit more than three months, that's the way to go, based on real value that, you, that your clients are getting from your product, rather than based on excuses. I provided the technology. The technology have done exactly what I've said. It diminished the limitation. The fact that it didn't got bottom line result is because he's stupid. That's not an answer still your responsibility if you really want to strive for the long run. Hopefully you will take this message and hopefully also internally whenever you buy a new technology, whether or not it's a machine or a process, exactly the same analysis. What limitation this technology diminish? What is going to be the anachronistic rules? How are we changing these rules? Otherwise, you will get just a fraction of the real benefits. It's so simple, and the extent that we don't do it is startling. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you.